Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's June 27th, 2013. This is not a Day 9 Daily. This is Day 9 Storytime, and I'd like to tell you a story of how I almost died. Now, I want to start when you're a young child. Whenever you're a kid, you have fantasies about being a superhero. Literally every kid in the universe does. Like Wolverine, can shoot like spikes out of his hands. Superman can fly. Green Lantern has the power of green, and he can, like, make hammers that are green and shit. Yes! I wanted to have superpowers as a kid. Not, and it wasn't really super ambitious. I wanted to be able to turn into a squirrel, because I watched Tiny Toons, and I wanted to hang out with them. But, as you get older and older, even such non-ambitious superpower dreams get slowly quashed as you get homework and essays and... You know, there's a little spike up in middle school where I'm like, look, just, I want to be in Hogwarts. I want to fail out of Hogwarts. That's how meager my dreams became as I got older, as I realized soon enough, I was just an ordinary, average individual. Until I hit college, I actually found out that I'm not an ordinary person. I found out that I actually have special gifts that permit me to study with Professor Xavier in the mansion. Special gifts that only select few with mitochondrial radiation, all that stuff. I have it. I can stay up all night. What a realization. Are you kidding me? You can stay up all night? Now listen, I know a lot of your minds are already blown. I could stay up all night long. I literally, with the power of will, can forge extra hours of the day of my own volition. The realization was uncanny. I'd always gone to bed on time, like 11.30. Like, not like uh, before midnight. 11.30 is when I used to go to bed. I used to get up at 6.30 every day. Exactly seven hours of sleep. But then I found out that I could stay up all night. Suddenly, I was showing up to class groggy. Now, the thing is, every young superpower person, you know, th there's that period of learning where you don't, you don't have, like, full ability. You know, like Peter Petrelli. He could do all sorts of stuff, but he just didn't know how to. It was kind of hard. It's like riding a bicycle. It doesn't matter if you have the bicycle as a superpower. You've got to be able to pedal and balance with the power of gyroscopes. And Peter Petrelli, once he learned his powers... Still didn't fucking use them in seasons two, three, four, five. I don't understand. Either way, I was like that. I stayed up all night and I'd show up to class groggy and my friend would be like, dude, Sean, what'd you do last night? I'd be like, dude, I stayed up all night. And he's like, did you just do all your homework for the week? And I was like, well, I did like half the homework, but then I, you know, I got on the internet in case I would miss something. I don't know, I just wanted to be there in case something happened. And I actually googled my way onto a uh, report on glyphosate. It's like, glyphosate? Is that like griffin saliva? I'm like, no, 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 it's like a carcinogenic thing in water that, you know, can hurt fish. But I want to assure you that in 11 steelhead and salmon ESUs surveyed, none were at levels uh, that were unsafe. Completely useless all-nighters. But it was those beginning inklings as I began to hone my superpowers for when I finally entered grad school. And don't tell me you've never got on a stupid Google binge. Don't tell me you've never been on Wikipedia and learned about penguin migration patterns when you didn't even like penguins in the first place. I knew all sorts of great things. And again, if you want any information on glyphosate, please feel free to call Patrick Matterson who's the head of the glyphosate research, 117-page paper I stumbled across. So I get to grad school, and this is where I begin using this, not even out of necessity, just because I like it. Suddenly, when I'm in grad school, I'm realizing I can stay up all night and do so much work that I can take on extra projects. And in fact, in my second semester of grad school, this is when my superpowers finished superhero puberty, whatever it is, I don't know, um, I, I, I came out with a lot of extra, a lot of extra hair. That's great from you know honing my superpower. But this is when I started the daily. I was doing an independent game project. I was uh, taking uh, full-time grad school courses. I was working a full-time job, and I was starting to read a lot of comic books. I mean, look at this superpowers. Occasionally, needed to stay up all night to do a little of extra uh, programming. 
Now, this discussion of superpowers brings me to the beginning of our story. Once upon a time, I was wrapping up the second semester of my grad school, and it was uh, the final two weeks. Now, a lot of you, you know, if you're studying just a sort of typical structure of school, you'll have like final exams, or you have like a big test, or something like that. I was in the interactive media division at USC, so we had projects we had to turn in. So I would be working away on various games or interactive pieces to showcase and to do presentations on, and people would be there to sort of like attack issues that they found in them and I had to like defend there and be really strong and stuff so I had all my school presentations that I had to do um, all the usual stuff with coursework but the biggest one the most significant of all was Puppet Man let me tell you about Puppet Man oh yeah Puppet Man was an educational math game created for an education research group called CREST, the Center for Research on Education Standards and Student Testing. Puppet Man. Yes, it was designed to teach fractions. Mm, yeah, and I already see people getting ready to Google stuff. Oh yeah. Puppet Man was it. Puppet Man is what I did as a job. I was also an Annenberg Fellow at USC, so that sort of dovetailed into the research. So as things built up to that final week, there was a lot writing on Puppet Man. Now, to be even be able to talk about what that final week was like, I gotta tell you about Puppet Man. So here's the thing, is that everyone in the universe hates math. Everyone fucking hates math for some reason. I don't understand why that is, but people love games. People love games. So what Puppet Man was, is it was an attempt to shove this thing that people hate into this thing that people love. It was like flavored medicine. Just try to get kids to do math. And see, okay, look, some of you are typing, I love math. I don't understand. I don't understand why people, okay, here's the thing. It's okay socially to shit on math. That's consider. it's encouraged. It's encouraged, okay? Like, okay, like our, our whole society, right? It's about like equality of gender and ethnicity and Prop 8 was just supported by the Supreme Court to make sure marriage equality is there. But, Sean, what did you study in college? Oh, I studied math. Well, I, oh, I hate math. Oh, I do. Well, what do you like? Well, I fucking hate that. That's not, it, what are you studying? It's, uh, well, anthropology? I'm like, well, that's it's interesting. I can't attack back. I can't be like, anthropology sucks. I can't do, I had an engineer once tell me that he hated math. And he's like, no, you know, the structures and engineering and the materials part, but I don't know, I don't like math. I'm like, you don't like math? What if you were building a baby crib and you mess up a calculation, <laughs> dead baby? The, the life of that baby demands that you like math. Fucking asshole. How can you not like? Anyway, so I'm making this game for children. Um, so they love kids. Um, and the idea of this is it was a game where you have Puppet Man. He's the protagonist. And he has to get to this end position and there's this intricate maze with little platforms and you put trampolines on the platforms that have a fractional number on it and it will launch him some fraction of a distance around so it's kind of like an adding fractions game I think I wanted to make sure it was fun I wanted to make sure it was fun my friend you'll my friend uh, Dr. Daniel Dr. Daniel P assisted me in designing this game, worked with the Crest group, the awesomest group of people in the known universe. It was probably one of the awesomest work experiences I'd ever had until that final week. Because in the final week, everything had to get done. As an Annenberg Fellow, there was an annual Annenberg Presentation Festival, where all the Annenberg Fellows get together and we present our various research on what we've been doing throughout the year and why it has academic merit. And it's like open to the public, and there's like a little wine and hors d'oeuvre bar, and everyone has to dress up. It's super formal. Um, and I had this in addition to a whole bunch of other projects. However, though no mortal would be able to get through this week, I had superpowers. I knew how to avoid sleep. 
So on Monday, I woke up, worked all day, late into the evening, went to bed, three hours of sleep, woke up again on Tuesday, worked 45 minute time, nap three hours every night, napping here and there, getting up, churning caffeine, not eating too much because God forbid a food coma interrupt the productivity of a class three mutant. I kept powering all the way through the week until it was Wednesday and Thursday was the morning of the Annenberg presentations. I got up at 7 a.m., worked my little ass off until around nine. I thought I would be able to stop at 5 p.m., but no, things got a little tricky with my other programming projects. So thusly, at 9 p.m., I had to begin getting Puppet Man ready because I was going to present why it was research worthy, what academic merit was so contained within this beautiful game. And I had to demo it. And I promised that it would be able to do things that didn't exist yet. And this is where a coding marathon began. Now, coding is much like channeling the power of the duck. The duck moves gracefully across the water, looking cute and multicolored and decorative in nature. Underneath the water, you have no idea what's going on. That duck might be farting to propel itself along and using a broken leg as a rudder, but it is the duck with its completely malformed underwater movement structure, it still gracefully moves across the water. And to get that code done, I channeled the power of a duck. I became the duck. So in my code, things started to make no fucking sense at all. Let me tell you about some interesting things. So you have to solve levels of varying mathematical difficulty using Puppet Man and trampolines. Where is the code to generate the next level? It's a function call on Puppet Man, which means that if he dies, the game stops happening. Well, this is an issue. I don't know why I put the function call for the new level on Puppet Man. So you know what? When he launches himself to his death, rather than having him die, I'm going to teleport him off screen, show a brand new death instantiation with exploding feathers and all that. And then I'm going to call the next function to reload the level. And then I'm going to teleport him back on screen. Oh, there's only ever one Puppet Man. It's seriously, it's like that guy in the Prestige. Don't worry, even if you haven't seen it, that's not a spoiler. So, this thing was a mess, and I was getting frustrated. I was at like 5 a.m. Now, to be the superhero that I was, to be able to work so hard, and to stay up for so many hours doing such demanding work, I have to curse violently at the code. I have to involve every bit of emotion and rage and passion that I have for Puppet Man into the code. So all of a sudden, I, J, these are not variable names in my code, I have come on and get there and shit dicks. This is the code that I am churning out at 5 a.m., trying to get it done by 9 a.m. when the door is open and I can begin stepping into the presentation zone. We have come on dot generate level Bracket, get there, plus shit dicks, and semicolon, and you know what? That compiled. It compiled beautiful, beautifully. We had four loops with boner plus plus because I needed it. Only the creative variable naming could have kept me going all night long. But here's the issue. Because everything was so stupidly hacked together, because Puppet Man's save state was under a trampoline function. Don't tell, don't tell anyone I said that. I still hope they haven't found that code because I had to give it to them at the end of the year. Even though it was so stupid, excuse me, because it was so stupid, things started to go a little long. I anticipated being done at 7 a.m. and now it's 7.15 and 7.30 and 7.45 and 8. And I'm like, when am I going to prepare this presentation? I get done at 8.15 and I'm like, all right, all right, it's time to walk to campus. I gotta walk to campus because at that time I lived within walking distance. So I start looking around. I have a laptop. I'm gonna load it onto the laptop and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get there and I'm gonna start my presentation. I'm gonna get it done because I like presentations. I'm gonna do a good job at presentations and I'm gonna nail this shit. And I couldn't find the power cord. I couldn't find the power cord anywhere.
So I'm like looking for the power cord. And I mean, you might say something like, well, why didn't you just create it as a Google Doc and you could have just done the presentation there? Because I'd been up for 26 hours after sleeping on and off for an hour every now and again. There was one thing that I was designed to do at that time, to be the zombie looking for a power cord that demanded power cords for sustenance. So I'm shuffling around the room and eventually I just find it in my suitcase for some reason. So I get it out and I... Okay, okay, it's 8.45, and I rush there, and I have, like, some semblance of a suit. I have a blazer that fits nice, a shirt that apparently wasn't mine because the arms came to here. That's fine, I'm wearing a blazer, it'll cover it up. I've been up all night, all right, reapply deodorant, start huffing and puffing my way there. Get in there at 9, start setting up. All the other Annenberg fellows are there setting up these beautiful, elaborate displays with graphs and charts. And the hors d'oeuvres are exquisitely set out on this buffet of, of opulence. And there's this bartender who's going, Sir, would you like a red wine? And I was like, yeah, give me a red wine. Give me the wine. So I take two glasses of wine. I set them down. I'm like dual wielding. I am the rogue of presentations for maximum APS. A stands for alcohol. So I open up my... I open up my presentation, and I'm like, let's make this lecture, all right? Let's do this. So I sit down, and I'm like, and I start making the presentation up. Let's use USC colors. And if you don't know the USC colors, it's this deep crimson with this rich, bright gold. And I was like, all right, red and yellow. And the red I used was like 255-00 red. I'm talking red. Like, Happy Meals are not as bright and vivid is the color palette I chose for this presentation. 255-00 red, bright yellow letters with this red background. And I'm like, all right, Trojan pride, fry it, up, fry it on. So I start whipping together this presentation. I'm like hooking up the laptop, making sure Puppet Man compiles with all sorts of craziness. Does the level load properly from the Puppet Man function? All right, good, everything's great. Uh, yes, two more glasses of Cabernet would be great. Put them down, set those things down, keep on churning my way through it. And all of a sudden, sleepiness hits me. Now, for any of you who have never been a superhero before, here's an amazing technique to stay awake and stay focused. You don't eat. Don't eat. Not like literally nothing, but eat very little. Because if you're on a full stomach, your body will get sleepy and you will lie down. But if you're not eating that much, you'll be able to stay awake. So I was using this. I was using the spinach to my Popeye powers to be awake at that time, churning out a fairly legible, albeit hard to physically look at because of the colors presentation. <laughs> and then sleepiness hit it. Everything was going so well, coded all that stuff, got my game project done the previous day, presentation was going well, I only think I needed two or three uh, more sets of slides and I'd be in good condition. All of a sudden my vision went, and I was like, I don't think I'm on the top of a building looking down, but that's exactly how I feel. And I was like, okay, no, you've got to keep it together. And I'm trying to write, and then my eyes start crossing. I don't know if you've ever been so exhausted that your eyes start crossing, but there it was. Eyes crossing, looking at a laptop screen with 255-00 red as the background. God help me. But I didn't need that, because I was channeling the power of the duck. To be able to stay awake for 28 hours, we have some trade-offs. What's going on underneath the surface, that's fine. I am a superhero. I am the duck. So I pull this thing together, get ready to present, and I present with glass number five off in the corner. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Puppet Man. The clock strikes 10 a.m. I'm standing ready. Beaming white smile. My chipped tooth hadn't been fixed yet, so I looked a little goofy, but that's fine. I was in a group full of Annenberg fellows, engineers, artisans, communications majors, all of whom had some sort of varying chipped tooth aspect. And if they didn't, then they're assholes, because no one that smart should be that good looking. But anyways... There I was, ready and eager and willing to show people the cunning research that I had provided. So when people came to my thing, they stood close and then saw the slides and took a few steps back. And even though I had been awake for 28 total hours at that point in time, I used 
this beautifully built presentation with words such as scaffolding, learning metrics, and student efficacies, and they went, ooh, and they were shivering at my intellectual ketchup and mustard presentation. I showed them a demo of Puppet Man, they played it, they laughed, and they said, and how, how are the students enjoying this? And I was way too tired at that point. So they were like, Sean, how, is this, how are the students enjoying playing Puppet Man? And I was like, the students are fine, they're fine, you don't, don't worry about them, don't worry about them, they're okay. And, I, you know, there's these weird things that your brain does when it's on the extreme edge of exhaustion because it's not just that I'd been awake for a long time, it's that I'd been awake for a long time working so hard and trying to focus so much. So there's this great engineer named Harsh. Literally, his name was Harsh. And Harsh came up to me and he's like, oh, hey, Sean, good to see you again. Dude, uh, how's, how's the pre presenting going? I mean, like, man, things are going... Not really very well on my end. Um, oh, by the way, like Harsh is, he, he, was, he was this Indian guy. He was great. He was an engineer at USC. His name was Harsh Vastangam. Harsh Vastangam. Is that not a great name? And his presentation was amazing. He was like, he was like, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Harsh Vastangam. And this is a study of the resonance of bridge structures as measure, measured by thermomolecular detectors. And I'm like, my name is Sean Pye, and this is Puppet Man. Not even at the same level. Um, he was a mechanical engineer, by the way. So, so Harsh is like, he's, he's you know really pleasant. He's like, oh, cool. Well, I mean, like, I mean, where did you do some testing and things like, you know, did the kids like him? Like, what sort of things did you change? And I'm, I'm opening my eyes as wide as I can, but they're crossing. My eyes are crossing because I'm so tired and I'm jerking. Jerking awake, I'm like, and my lips are purple because I'm like, and then the kids are fine. Don't worry about the children. The children like the mathematics. The children are very important. Math is important to children. It looked like somewhere in the room, the hidden Darth Vader was like choking me. Like you make sure they enjoy fractions, Luke. I'm like, oh, they love it, right? So. So I got through that after polishing off Cabernet glass number six, purple lipped, had to go home and brush my lips and take my second shower over the waking period because 24 hours had passed. It was finally after this work bender, I got the chance to climb in my bed and think, oh, holy shit, I have to prepare a daily. So I get out of bed. It's like 3.30 or 4, the daily's at 7, and I'm like... All right, what is interesting about StarCraft on this frickin' Wednesday? Oh my god, so I do the daily, I get through it, I finally get through the daily, and if, by the way, if you watch some of the dailies in the early hundreds, there's a couple where I'm a little loopy, I'm a little like, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna, we're, this build order is fine, Flash is fine, it's just a game, it's, just, it's very good. I have no idea which daily it was. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go try to identify what number daily to look up so you can see my disheveled state. Why would I do that? I'd rather just tell you the story. So finally, it's 8:30 p.m. The daily has just concluded. I've gotten through all the work I needed to get through. I need to get. I had all the presentations done at school, and I had not eaten in nearly 36 hours. However. I had to go to bed because I was getting on a flight the next morning to Colorado to do a presentation on Puppet Man and fly home the same day. And then it was summer break. That was it. So at 8.30 p.m., starving to death, I go to sleep. I was running the risk of starving to death while sleeping. But you know what? Sometimes when you channel the power of the duck, you just have to use that broken leg as a rudder. I wake up at 4 a.m., the flight's at 6. Daniel P. picks me up, and I'm like, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. Like, he calls me at, like, 3.30. He's like, I'm coming over, and I'm just like, Aah! and I just, like, pack. I'm, like, screaming, like, Aah! Aah! throwing things in there, like, putting on more deodorant. Finally get to the airport. I'm so hungry. I'm quite tired, but mainly I'm hungry. We get there, 
Flight takes off at 6, it's around 5.15, and I see a McDonald's. And it's interesting, you know, people talk a lot about out-of-body experiences, about being close to death, perhaps in a car accident, or if there's an illness that m may have been terminal, and they see themselves lying there, or life flashes before their eyes, or time slows down, but in that moment when I saw the McDonald's, suddenly my muscles and limbs were not my own. I began shambling towards there, and I was like, can I get just like yeah, bacon, egg, and cheese biscuits, and orange juice, and a hash brown, and a hash brown, and some orange juice, and a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit, and can you get mayonnaise? And she's like, Jesus, it's it's 5.30 in the morning, do you want mayonnaise? I And like, I couldn't even step in and try to say like, holy shit, let me have some restraint here, Not not a chance. This was not my this was not my consciousness i was possessed i had bread lust and mayo need i had to get it can can you just can you just get the mayonnaise packets and can you just put them in the bag with the biscuits and can you make sure that there are three of the biscuits next to the hash browns with the mayonnaise so she's just like you got it sir I don't get paid enough for this. She shoves it all in the bag, and I sit there, and I'm like, Ugh. I don't even taste it. To this day, I don't even know what it tasted like. I just shoved it in my body. Like, like my face was a slot machine, and each one was a coin, and I thought I was going to win something. Like, just it kept going in me. And finally, I feel my muscles relax, and I'm like, oh. Oh, my God, I'm going to sleep so hard on this plane. I know some people don't like flying, so they get a little drunk, and they get on the plane and sleep. I just ate more food than makes sense. I packed my body to capacity. It hurt a little bit, but like how distended my stomach was at that point. And I'm like, all right, I'm just going to sleep. I'm going to do this presentation. I'm going to come home, and that's it. And as I'm getting ready to board the plane, I feel it. I feel this tight clench in my heart that makes me go, oh. I remember being a little thrown off balance because it was both a pang and then a squeeze, and I went, oh, oh, whew. okay, 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 we're okay, we're okay. I'm like scanning a thing, like, dude, and she's like, have a nice flight, and I'm like, you too. I'm not fucking thinking about how that doesn't make sense. Okay, okay, okay. We're all right, so I get on the plane, and I'm trying to sit down, it's like, Ugh, it clenches up again. Ow, God. <sighs> So I sit down, sit down on the, in the plane, and then all of a sudden it just starts happening regularly, the squeeze of pain, and then it goes away, and a few seconds pass, and the squeeze of pain, and then it goes away, and a few seconds pass, and the squeeze of pain, and I'm like, oh God, what's happening to me, what's happening to me, what's happening to me, what's happening to me, and the woman next to me is like, oh, I get nervous on flights, don't worry, and I'm like, no, it's my heart, and she's like, your heart hurts because you're so nervous, I'm like, no, no, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, <sighs> and I'm sitting there, and like, takeoff happens, and I'm a nervous flyer, too, I don't like takeoff, where it's all like, you know, because at least in a roller coaster, you see where the zones of death are, I don't even know what's going to happen, and there's no ground bef uh, beneath you, so, so much like, ugh, ugh, we're 30 minutes into the plane ride, and my heart hasn't stopped hurting, literally every 10 seconds without fail, without fail, I get this clenching feeling, and I'm so anxious, I get up out of my seat, and I just go try to find some flight attendant. The instant they turn off the seatbelts, because I'm not going to break a rule. Are you kidding me? I was raised properly. The seatbelt sign says stay fastened. I better keep it fastened. I mean, if I die, that's unfortunate, but, you know, I obeyed. Anyway, it just goes off, so I get up and I wander in there. And I look at this woman, this flight attendant, Belinda. And I say, um, uh, excuse me, um, I'm kind of breathing heavily. I'm, like, really anxious because, you know, normally... If I have a headache, I understand what that means. I take some Advil. If I have a sore throat, I drink nice fluids. Everything's going to be fine. If I, <clears throat> I'll take a lozenge. Like, everything makes sense, but I've never had chest pains in my heart before. On my heart. In a heart, hearts are pretty important. They're very, very important. So I go up to her, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know if um, you're the right person to ask about, but uh, I've been having some severe heart pains like right before takeoff and going into it. So I, I, I'm, I'm really nervous because they won't stop. And I don't know if you have anything or if you know anything about that, but I'm, I'm, really, I'm really just getting kind of nervous. And she looks at me and she goes, 
well you look healthy. I'm like, Belinda. Belinda, I, are you trying to eye-fuck me? Because I'm worried that I'm going to die. So maybe we should wait a little bit on the eye-fucking. Do, do you think? You haven't even given me drink service yet. Is this how it's done? Anytime someone needs to go to the bathroom, you tell them how healthy they look? So, but, but, but she's like, but she's like, well, you look healthy. And I'm like, no, I mean, I'm really nervous. She's like, I'm sure it's nothing. If it still is a problem, we can give you some oxygen. Everything's going to be okay, but... I assure you, you look quite healthy. So I go back to my seat after being appraised highly by Belinda the Sky Nymph and sit there and it won't go away. When I'm in Colorado, you know, the air is a little thinner there. It's really fresh. I can drink the tap water without it being opaque. But nothing seems to make it go away. I'm scared to eat. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm talking about learning metrics and student efficacy and scaffolding to the best of my ability. And it slowly starts to tone down. I'm so relieved and all these brilliant education researchers are coming up to me and asking me sincerely questions that involve learning metrics and student efficacies and scaffolding and I can, without any quips or quivering or shaking or loss of words, rattle off them answers showcasing puppet man screenshots oh it's interactive blew their minds i was feeling prideful i was feeling proud got on the flight back at 6 p.m landed at 8 went home collapsed for a comfortable 12 hours of sleep with my heart finally having died down i woke up at around 1 30 the next day and it was summer break so I had things to do. I had been using XP for quite some time, but I had just bought a brand new rig to do the daily from, so I, I, needed Windows 7. So I go to my roommate Kevin and let him know what's up. Now let me just take a moment and tell you about Kevin. Kevin is the man. Kevin is a yes man to the extreme. You know those people where you're like, hey, is there any chance you can drive me to the airport? And they're like, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, totally. Kevin's like that times a billion. Like, if I went up to Kevin, I was like, dude, do you want to, like, cut each other's hair and do karaoke? He'd be like, I got scissors. And he'd be in no matter what. He will always say yes. So I go up to him, like, dude, Kevin, do you want to go get Windows 7 and, like, a dozen donuts? And he's like, I'll drive. So we hop back in to his car. We start driving. We go to Best Buy. We've already eaten, you know, five, six donuts each. It's great. It's amazing. They're fresh baked. It's by this donut shop nearby our house. It doesn't even have a name. You just go in and there's donuts. I don't know. Normally, you know, it's like Spud Nuts Donuts or Winchell's Donuts or Krispy Kreme. No, none of that. It's just you go in there and he's like, hello. She serves you donuts. And yes, it is the same Kevin that was in my Link to the Past playthrough and my Last of Us playthrough. So we get to this Best Buy and we go in there. You know, of course, Best Buy is a like, huge. We have to like go to the nerd section. There's like all the Best Buy people swarming, ready to help anyone. Do you need help? Do you want a TV? I'll get you a TV. Uh, commission. So we're there, and uh, I say, "Yeah, I'd like a copy of Windows 7." And they go, "Ah, we're out of Windows 7." And I'm like, "You're out of Windows 7? You're Best Buy?" And they're like, "Ah, mm, oh, oh, we don't have any." I'm like, you don't have Windows 7? You don't have... And I just like fall to my legs. It's the worst, hardest pang in my heart I've ever had to this point. Still today. And I'm like... Ugh, uh, uh, uh. And he's like, oh my god. Oh my god, Windows 7 will be here tomorrow. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It just hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And just... Uh, just give me a second. He's like, look, XP works fine. XP is a good product. Most things you can do with 7, you can do in XP. I'm like, I fucking know. I have XP. Uh, uh, God, Kevin, Kevin, something, something's wrong. Something's wrong. So he like, Kevin like, like literally holds me up and I'm like holding my heart. It hurts so much. And then finally the pain lifts and I'm like, okay, okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. We're okay. We're okay. So, so. We get in Kevin's car, and he's like, you know what? Let me call my dad. He knows what to do in this situation. So now, Kevin's an EMT now. He wasn't an EMT then. So Kevin calls his dad and says, yeah, dad, you know, Sean, he's been, you know, he's kind of had a heart, you know, week, and now his heart's hurting, like, really bad. And his dad was like, 
take him to the emergency room now. And I was like, um, uh, um, let me, uh, you know, you know, let me double check another source. So I call the USC Health Clinic. And I'm like, yeah, hi. You know, I know you're closed. Um, and I know this is the emergency line, but I just have fast, really fast questions, real quick here. I was wondering um, if I'm getting persistent pangs of like sort of like a stabbing pain in my heart. What should I do? She's like, drive to the emergency room immediately. And I'm like, would water help? I can get water. Um, maybe Nyquil. Maybe I should just go to sleep. And she's like, go to the ER now. So then Kevin and I have to get on the 405, which, as you know, is the only highway slash parking lot in existence. It takes us like two hours to get all the way to the emergency room. And the whole time, I'm so nervous. When the heart pains happened on the plane and I got told I looked healthy, so nervous. Here, on the freeway, nervous, nothing to do but wait. I know what a headache is, I know what a sore throat is, I know what most other aches are, but I don't know what stabbing heart pains are. I just don't know. But I just have to wait. So we finally get to this emergency room. We go in there, and I run in there, and I'm like, uh, miss, one behind the receptionist counter, miss, um, Okay, so I'm having I'm having severe heart pains. I don't know what's wrong, and so I just I don't know I don't know if this is the right place to be, but this is an emergency. And she's like, "All right, cool, fill out a thing, and here's a wristband, and have a seat." And then I look behind me, and the waiting room is like the size of this room, but there's like a hundred people in there, li literally, figuratively speaking, literally, like figuratively, there's like a lot. It's packed, literally, figuratively. It's a lot of people in there. And I look around, and there's all these people just sitting there, slumped. And I'm like, there's lines at the emergency room? I'd never really been to an emergency room with lines, but it's Los Angeles. There's a lot of people. And there's, there's this kid there, like, sitting there, playing on, like, a PSP, is a kid with clearly a broken leg because his, his thigh did this, and there was a knee, and it went down, and then there was a bend, and it went like that. And he's playing his PSP. He looked like a poorly designed creature from Spore. I'm like, that shouldn't be able to walk. And he's just playing. But you know what? He was better off than everyone. He was fine. He was playing his PSP. Once I, once I finally sat down there, in the room, it's just... <sighs> like moans from everyone. Like really tired zombies that are a little too exhausted to go eat the living. They're just... <sighs> And I turn to Kevin and I'm like, dude, can you go get me Windows 7? And he's like, you got it, man. I'll drive there right now. I need to pick up Street Fighter 4. So Kevin just up and leaves. My phone's dead and I'm just sitting there locked in this emergency room. And I'm just like, uh, uh, and the hours are ticking by. We got there at like 9. And it's like midnight now. And there's this woman who's been sitting next to me the whole time, just like this. And she turns to me. And then looks forward and then just goes... It just, it just like... It just fell out of her. She didn't puke, it just... It just left her. She just secreted it down onto the floor. And no one even reacted. Everyone was just like... Ugh. And I was just like... Ugh. I was in this like horror thing. And I might not even be getting Windows 7 at this point. I was like panicked, man. So finally it's 1am when they call me in. They're like... Uh, Sean, yeah, come on in. And this nurse is like lightning speed. Like if this was like a time trial from Crash Bandicoot, you would not beat it. Period. You would have to use like Game Genie or some shit. Like she was like going, and I just saw like her shoes around the corner. I'm like, <sighs> like trying to run. And I'm like sweating because I'm out of shape. I'm like, look, look, I'm telling a story and I'm sweating profusely. Imagine me trying to follow a nurse in this like brightly lit, sterile environment with pastel colors on the walls to calm me down, I bet. So finally I turn the corner and she's gone, but there's a room in there with the door open. And I'm like, Okay, okay, so I like go in the room and I like, I like sit down, still just, just 
clenching up. <sighs> Finally, this doctor comes in. He's like, uh, yeah, are you Sean? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, mm. shuts the door. So uh, what seems to be the problem? And I can tell by that tone of voice, I'm not a person to him. I'm just meat at 1.22 a.m. in the morning. He's tired. He's worked all day. What's the problem? Is it really an emergency? I said, well, I, you know, for about two days now, uh, I've been having these stabbing pains in my heart, and they sort of come, ah, there was one there, and it hurts really bad, and I just, I don't know, I don't know what it is, I don't know how to treat, I don't know if I should be taking anything, I, don't, I I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just nervous and concerned, and he's like, all right, we'll take off your clothes. I'm like, where did you get your medical degree? Because I've been to doctors before, and normally there's like, there's some steps in between. I've never been to a doctor. I'm like, hey doc, my eye's kind of watery, and it won't stop being watery. And he's like, all right, we'll spread your legs and bite this block of wood. And I'm like, what? Did, did your credentials get double checked? I'm not just going to strip because I told you I'm worried I'm going to die. You got to give me a build up, man. So I'm naked, um, and I don't know if you've ever been in a hospital where they make you take all your clothes off. They have, I think, I think it's called like a medical gown, I think is the name of it. Now when I think gown, I think of like a ballet, where it's like, oh, look at the lovely gown, oh, how wonderful. Or you may be a night gown that's already kind of nice. Like this thing is just like a, like a, like a, like a large bib. It has like a thing here, and then there's like this sheet of fabric that maybe that maybe goes to like here, and that's it. Nothing on the sides. No, it's just like, just like straight down. There's not even a thing tied at the back. It's just like a flap. It's like low budget lingerie is what it is. Like butt totally exposed and stuff. And you know he's like talking to me, and I have to like face him because even if I'm like this, well, if we're at this angle, there's my penis. There it is. He doesn't really want to, but he says hello, right? It's So I'm trying to, like, face him, and he's like, okay, uh, do you smoke? Do you drink? Do you have any medical allergies? And I'm like, couldn't we have asked these questions when I had clothes on? Did I have to be like this? I'm, like, ashamed. I'm, like, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, aware of their nakedness. I'm like, no, oh, no, I don't smoke. No, I drink infrequently. I don't know, maybe I'm doing a presentation, but, you know, I don't know, I... No, oh, I'm, you know, I'm allergic to Pepto-Bismol. It makes my skin feel funny. I don't know. I don't like pink as a color in general. I'm, I'm 20, I'm 24, uh, going through all these things. He's like, uh-huh, he's meat. He's not real. He's not a real person. If he dies, will people die? I'm just like, <sighs> and he's like, all right, well, uh, here's a cup. Um, let's get a urine sample from you and we'll run some tests. And then he leaves. And I'm like, <gasps> stand up in my silly flap Ugh, with the heart pains I'm like ah, God. I'm like looking out this open door and there's like no one it's like the abandoned hospital at the start of The Walking Dead and I need to get a urine sample I don't even know where the bathroom is so I'm like I'm like walking out there and if anyone turns the corner they're gonna think I'm like a gorilla burn victim or like fucking sasquatch starting puberty because let me tell you again it, it go it go like all across the whole body it's like that so <laughs> so i'm out there and i'm like <sighs> nervous i'm like quivering and, and like kevin's like hey sean i'm like <gasps> i'm like hold my thing down i'm like hey hey i just have to do a urine sample he's like oh yeah it's down that hallway and i'm like oh Carefully angling myself because I mean if he sees my penis he's gonna turn to stone I've read the legends of Medusa like you don't want that fucking shit happening with your best friend so So I do the sample and I get there and I give him a test and they take some blood and they put a thing on me And they like you know shine a light in my eyes. It's very bright, you know So all that stuff happens And it's five in the morning Kevin has Windows 7 We're playing magic and every time I'm like, come on, I need a spell, no land, come on, I need a spell, and I draw it, and it's a swamp, and I'm like, Aah! it's like, don't play magic when you have heart pains. Uh, so, so finally, so finally, after seeing the doctor and the nurse and a different nurse and the same doctor and one of the same nurses and the doctor again, he comes back and he looks at me and he's like, 
Well, Sean, um, we've done the tests. And uh, by and large, it seems that across the board, the tests are inconclusive. And I'm like, I don't. What is, why? What, what's, what's happening? So now my heart's pounding in addition to having these sharp squeezes of pain. And I'm like, so, so what does that mean? He's like, well, we can keep you in here for various tests. There's things that we can do to find out what's sort of going wrong. You know, there's uh, some tests we can do to find out what uh, the, the, the sort of perhaps arrhythmia is with your heart or the, or the source of the heart pain is. And I'm like, okay, is that, is that, is that bad? Is that horrible? Does that mean I'm going to die? And he's like, well, it's inconclusive. There's a couple of nasty things that it isn't. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, so, you know, I, I wanna get some more information. So when did these pains start? I was like, they started when I got on, I got on, the, on the plane yesterday. And he's like, okay, and what did, did you eat anything before you got on the plane? I was like, McDonald's, and he's like, Okay, well, what about the day before? And I was like, well, I, I had like six glasses of Cabernet. And he's like, oh, well, what did you have before that? And I was like, oh, nothing. I stayed up all night. And he gives me this look. And he's like, what did you have on the night that you stayed up all night? I was like, no, I didn't eat anything. I mean, I'm, to channel my superpower, I shouldn't eat. It's, you know, it helps me stay awake. And he's like, well, all right, let me, let me tell you something. Let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you what's going on, Sean. And I'm like, how many days do I have to live? Can I call my brother and tell him I love him? What did I do? Did I kill myself? I love my brother. Tell my brother I love him. And thank Cambria for giving me Manfred. And he's like, look, if you're not eating, your stomach gets acidic. And if you stay up late, it gets more acidic. And if you pour an acidic substance on there, there will be some severe irritation where the stomach meets the esophagus, which is located right behind the heart. And I go, are you telling me I have fucking heartburn? And he's like, it's not known to be lethal. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, what the fuck? I look down at this like Magic the Gathering game that I'm like losing. And the doctor's like, nurse, nurse, come in here, nurse. The nurse comes in and he's like, this young man was worried about his terminal heartburn. She's like, oh lord, that heartburn, it's a killer. <laughs> and I'm like... You're telling me I have heartburn? And he's like, well, that's my diagnosis. Here, just wait, and it'll go away. Don't drink spi or don't eat spicy foods, and you'll feel the same thing. <laughs> it was never your heart, it was just your tummy. And I was like... Why did I have to be naked for all of this? So, after having been thoroughly eye-boned by Belinda, the doctor, and needlessly Kevin... I put all my clothes back on, went home, and slept for another 12 hours. And when I woke up, I began installing Windows 7, and I remember reading the Sinestro Core Wars uh, book from the Green Lantern series. And as the Green Lantern was wielding all his powerful green hammers to crush the enemy, I read all of his wonderful superpowers without the slightest bit of envy.